Hello, and welcome to the History of Philosophy in India by Janardan Ganari and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Learn by Doing, Tantra. In this series, we've had the chance to dispel quite a few misconceptions about ancient Indian culture, that it offered only mysticism or religion, but no philosophy, that yoga is just a kind of gymnastic exercise, that the physical world is real, if you ask Advaita Vedantins, or alternatively, that anything but the physical world is real, if you ask the Charvakas. But the word from ancient India most apt to provoke inaccurate associations is Tantra. In Western countries, the first and probably last idea people have about Tantra is that it has something to do with sex. In India itself, Tantra is nowadays often equated with black magic. Nor has more detailed historical knowledge about Tantric rituals and beliefs prevented it from being the object of disdain and mockery. A pioneering Indian scholar of classical Tantra in the 20th century explained the rationale for studying it as follows. Someone should take up the study comprising the diagnosis, etiology, pathology, and prognosis of the disease so that more capable men may take up its treatment and eradication in the future. It would, however, be more helpful to think of Tantra as a tradition akin to yoga, in which philosophical ideas were put into practice. A wide range of rituals could enable the Tantric practitioner to achieve liberation from suffering and oneness with the Absolute, not to mention performing such feats as seeing objects that are buried underground, flying and turning invisible. Again, the connection to magic may remind us of yoga, and like yoga, Tantra has appeared in many guises in different periods. Its literature spans the divides between the Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain traditions, and there were numerous varieties and schools even just of Hindu Tantra in the classical period. We're going to focus especially on Tantra in the context of Buddhism and on the religious tradition called Shaivism, that is, the worship of the god Shiva. Within that tradition, we'll especially be discussing the non-dual strand of Shaiva Tantra represented by Abhinava Gupta, who lived around the year 1000. You may remember him from our look at the Indian aesthetic theory of Rasa. The more central aspects of Tantra are shared by both of these schools and other groups besides. At the risk of disappointing you, we must report that a fascination with ritualistic, spiritualized sex is not really one of them. We do have writings on this topic, including by Abhinava, but sexual practices were not the primary focus of classical Tantra. As we'll see later in this episode, even when such practices are discussed, there is more, or from a prurient point of view, less, going on than meets the eye. To quote a leading French scholar of Tantra, André Padou, Abhinava is not to be confused with the Marquis de Sade. Instead, Tantra is characterized especially by its openness to participants of all classes, often both men and women, and by a range of concrete ritual practices. These include meditation, breath control, repetitive chants called mantras, the use of mandalas, the initiation of the practitioner by a guru who will serve as a spiritual guide. If none of that sounds particularly philosophical, this is because it is only a list of the external practices that manifest and assist in the practitioner's attempt to achieve wisdom and liberation. That idea is even conveyed by a traditional etymology of the word tantra, which originally meant simply a teaching or a document that sets out a teaching. Tantra spreads wisdom that saves us from ignorance and suffering. The syllable tan means spreads, and the syllable tra means saves. Chronologically speaking, tantric practices go back deep into the ancient past. The Upanishads already discuss the ritual formulas called mantras, including the central example of Om. Thus, the Chanda Yoga Upanishad instructs us, one should venerate the high chant as this syllable, for one begins the high chant with Om. A man who utters this syllable with that knowledge enters this very syllable, the sound that is immortal and free from fear. As the gods become immortal by entering it, so will he. The same Upanishad also describes initiation with a guru, and you will remember from our look at these early texts how much stress they placed on the notion of breath. However, the first texts that one can classify as tantric in the full sense emerge around the 5th to 7th centuries AD, and especially within a strand of Hindu belief which worshipped Shiva. It would seem that the various tantric practices, like the recitation of mantras, were then borrowed from Shaivism by Buddhists. 
The Buddhist tantric texts are rather sensitive on this point and propose an alternative history, ascribing to the Buddha the premonition that the rituals he originally prescribed would be later adopted by other schools. Meanwhile, a legend circulated among Hindus that Shaivism was the result of a curse designed to punish those who stopped learning the Vedas properly. Tantra was being diagnosed as a kind of illness long before the 20th century then. Even as its rituals were adopted across the spectrum of Indian belief systems, so writers from across that spectrum dismissed the same rituals as preposterous. No less a thinker than Vasubandhu, who we saw initiating Yogacara Buddhism, held that mantras are meaningless gibberish. And when you look at the mantras, you may feel that he had a point. Some of them do indeed consist of apparent nonsense syllables, each of which is called a seed. In other cases, one repeats a meaningful yet mysterious phrase over and over, like Hamza Soham, meaning I am that divine Hamza bird. Typical of this mantra is that it is a near palindrome, a common structure in the many formulas that circulated in Tantra. Tradition had it that there are 70 million of them. One standard practice was to begin and end a mantra with Om, or some other basic mantra, effectively enveloping the rest of the formula. Breath itself is said to be a kind of mantra, as one breathes in and out thousands of times over a single day. The symmetrical structure of these mantras, the way they mimic the outward and inward movement of breath, is a clue to their underlying philosophical rationale, the theory that underlies this particular ritual form and is considered the key to its success. We are told that recitation of mantras without knowledge is like casting seed upon barren stone. That is why initiation with a guru is needed. He shares the mantra with the practitioner and reveals its meaning. We are not gurus, and this podcast is no substitute for an initiation rite, but we can still tell you something about the meaning of mantras in general terms. As suggested by the palindromic structure, mantras evoke the cyclical production of things, in the first instance, the outgoing and subsequent return of the entire universe. Here, we might think back to our earlier discussion of world cycles. Robert Yell has thus written, The belief in the efficacy of mantras is reinforced by their imitation of the natural order. They should be seen not as gibberish, like baby talk or birdsong, but rather as poetic language that symbolizes the world, and even the very origin of the world. A culmination of this way of thinking about mantra comes with Kashmir Shaivism, and especially the work of Abhinava Gupta. As so often, an important further source would be a commentary on his work, in this case by the 13th century exegete Jayarata. Though their extensive writings do not seem to have had much impact on actual religious practice in Kashmir, they do offer something of a high watermark for philosophical reflection about Tantra. Among other things, Abhinava sets out a sophisticated theory about the production of language, in which the generation of words represents, or is even identical with, the generation of the entire universe. To understand his views on this, we will need first to say something about his cosmology and the principles from which his universe is generated. Or, we should rather say, principle in the singular. Shaivism had long before Abhinava been a monotheistic sect, indeed among the first Indian belief systems, to endorse a single divine principle. Their principle, or god, was of course Shiva, who is identified as a pure, ineffable consciousness which experiences permanent bliss. Abhinava says that attempting to grasp it is like trying to step on the shadow of your own hat while wearing it. Thus far, the theory sounds a bit like Advaita Vedanta, and the strand of Shaivism is likewise called non-dual, in distinction from the Siddhanta variety of Shaivism. The Siddhanta Shaivites acknowledged the reality of the physical world, but regretted it deeply, seeing their religious rites as a means for escaping the suffering of this world. For Abhinava and other non-dual Shaivites, the point is instead to free ourselves of the ignorance that makes us think we are distinct from the divinity that is Shiva, who can also be called spirit, consciousness, self, and so on. While it would not be inaccurate to label this as a kind of monism, it is a kind of monism that is compatible with a complex cosmology. According to Abhinava, the universe as we experience it arises because of a vibration of self-awareness, which expresses itself in a threefold way as consciousness, will or desire, and cognition. This can occur only because Shiva, a male god, is one with the female god Shakti, who represents energy. 
as the punning motto of the non-dual Shaivites has it, without Shakti, Shiva would be a corpse, Shava. Thanks to the energy and self-directed activity brought by Shakti, consciousness does not remain inert, but goes forth to show itself as our multifarious empirical world. Yet all the things we see in this world are in truth one with the divine. The goal of the tantric practitioner is to realize his or her own identity with God by engaging in rituals that represent, or again, in some sense are just identical with, the process of the unfolding of all things from Shiva Shakti. Which brings us back to our mantras and the question of language. Shiva is also called the supreme word, a source of all language but as yet without articulation or expression. This supreme word begins to manifest itself as the aforementioned initial vibration of creative energy and self-awareness. As Jayarata puts it in his commentary on Abhinava, when the supreme word wishes to appear externally yet without producing the multiplicity associated with the process of what expresses and what is expressed, since the light of pure consciousness still prevails there, she is called the seeing or the visionary, and she is a form of the subject who sees. We might think of this as a moment when a thought is entertained mentally all at once without yet spelling it out in words. And in fact, Abhinava compares it to the flash of understanding posited by the grammarian Bhatrihari, in which a sentence's meaning is grasped in a single moment. At a further stage, articulated language is rehearsed mentally before being spoken aloud and thus fully expressed. Abhinava claims that there must be such a stage in the production of language, since otherwise children would never be able to learn to speak, nor would mutes be able to comprehend the words of others. Language is given forth from the human speaker in stages, emerging slowly from the body through its centers of energy, the famous chakras. Within each person, the origin is at the base of the spine, where power is coiled like a snake. Coiled translates the name of the goddess Kundalini, who is also responsible for the evolution of the phonemes from the simpler unspoken primordial word at the level of self-awareness. One text says that Kundalini is made of will, cognition, and action, effulgent, endowed with the properties of created things. She creates the garland of letters divided into 42, and when she divides into 50 the garland of the 50 phonemes, and with these phonemes she brings forth in succession the gods and the other things. So what we have here is a rich fusion of cosmology with philosophy of mind and language. It is important that, as we keep hinting, the production of the world is not merely symbolized by the production of language, but actually is linguistic, the universe being, as they say, pervaded by sound. So cosmic evolution can be mapped onto the Sanskrit alphabet, which constitutes words. Those three initial moments in Shiva's emergence into self-awareness consciousness, will, and cognition are connected to the three short vowels, A, I, and U. Vowels are associated with Shiva as the male principle, while consonants are the female analog, an idea that is sometimes set forth even more concretely, vowels are like the male seed, consonants like the womb. We can think of a single syllable, like OM, or really any combination of vowel and consonant, as representing the two aspects of the first principle the mating, and hence unity, of Shiva and Shakti. Perhaps this would have been Abhinava's explanation of another passage in the ancient Chanda Yoga Upanishad, as the leaves of a book are bored through by a pen, so all words are bored through by om. This gets us finally to the theme of sexual union and reproduction. As we've said, this theme plays a far more minor role in tantric literature than you might have expected. Sexual rituals are in fact only one aspect of a more general strand within Tantra called Kaula, in which a variety of shocking practices were endorsed. These ranged from sexual activities like adultery, incest, and group sex, to the consumption of oft-forbidden things like wine and meat, and even the drinking and eating of urine and excrement. In a passage that conveys Kaula Tantricism's apparent goal of being as scandalous as possible, we read the following advice about liberation. Inserting his organ into his mother's womb, pressing his sister's breasts, placing his foot upon his guru's head, the practitioner will be reborn no more. It did not take long for some tantric authors to insist that such advice is to be glossed as symbolic and allegorical. In this case, incest with the mother may mean the mind's awareness of the base of the body, the pressing of the sister's breasts a focus on the heart and throat, 
and the foot upon the guru's head, meditation on the brain. Such allegorical explanations notwithstanding, it is unsurprisingly a much-discussed question to what extent the shocking so-called left-handed practices were actually carried out. No doubt it varied widely. Some presumably took the advice literally and others symbolically, while still others thought that both levels of meaning were relevant. Bearing out the possibility of merely symbolic interpretation, some works spell out the true meaning of coded terminology, sometimes called twilight language. Either way, there is general agreement across Tantra that we can achieve spiritual aims through the body, correcting what might have been seen as an unwarranted asceticism within both Hinduism and Buddhism. One sign of this is that Tantra did not demand renunciation. Unlike a Buddhist or Jain monk, a Tantric practitioner could remain a householder. Another sign is that many Tantric texts display the frank ambition to achieve worldly advantages, hence the talk of performing magical feats like invisibility, of using Tantra to gain victory in battle, or even to do alchemy. Then too, even when sex and other rituals were practiced concretely, just as one would genuinely recite mantras thousands of times and not just talk idly about doing it, the aims were always spiritual. Thus, the sexual act would be a way of realizing one's identity with the union between male and female in the principle of Shiva Shakti, and would involve long practice control and often the avoidance of climax. As one scholar has written, the sublimation and focus on self-mastery mean that what is occurring psychologically and physiologically in those practices bears very little resemblance to sex as we generally understand it, since Buddhist tantric assumptions and aims are virtually indistinguishable from those of traditions more readily recognized as ascetic. It may seem paradoxical that such lofty spiritual aims should be pursued through a focus on bodily powers and experiences, but as Abhinava says, the body should be seen as full of all the paths, composed of all the divinities, and thus must be made an object of contemplation, of adoration, and of the rites of fulfillment. This is perhaps the key philosophical idea of Tantra. Especially in its non-dual Shaivite version, Tantra privileges pure consciousness as a first principle of all things, taking the empirical and bodily realm to be the outward manifestation of that principle. We are told to focus on and engage in worldly activities that are structurally identical to the workings of self-directed consciousness and its production of all things, notably the production of language in the form of mantras. Thereby, we can remove the otherwise impermeable veil that screens us from realizing our identity with the Absolute. It is no wonder that, in due course, when Islam came to India, Tantra was seen as congenial to Sufism. We might draw a further parallel to mysticism in medieval Christianity, or Kabbalah within Judaism. The latter offers particularly strong resonances in the form of an alphabet-based cosmology, with the ten letters, or sefirot, structuring a derivation of all things from an ineffable divine principle, the deployment of erotic language, and in so-called prophetic Kabbalah, even the chanting of apparently meaningless syllables. In none of these cases are we dealing with an irrationalism that competes with rational philosophical thought, but rather with attempts to show how philosophical ideas could be put into practice. It has been said that, while the master logicians like Dignago or Dharmakirti were devising hair-splitting arguments to interpret the world as a void entity, tantric ideas captured the heart of Buddhism through the back door. In fact, though, the tantric authors, both Buddhist and Hindu, had their own philosophical theories and hair-splitting distinctions. It's just that this was not enough in their view. We must marry abstract understanding to practical action, recognizing that everyday things, even supposedly vulgar and despised things, reflect and instantiate the structures of primordial reality. Sometimes you need to learn by doing. As we've said, Tantra was a phenomenon that cut across the intellectual divides of ancient India. Soon, we'll be talking about the relations between that culture and the world outside India. But first, we want to consider another pervasive issue that arises in pretty well all the traditions we've looked at in this podcast series. Like Tantra or yoga, it is something that will leap to mind for most people when they think of ancient Indian religion and philosophy, attitudes towards non-human animals. It was widely considered wrong to eat them, which is why the consumption of meat was one of the shocking left-handed tantric practices. 
Was this perhaps because Indians believed in reincarnation, so that by tucking into a stake, they might be eating a deceased family member? With any luck, this question will whet your appetite for the next episode, an interview with Amber Carpenter about animals in classical Indian thought, here on The History of Philosophy in India.